going on guys? I'm sitting here today with David Grady. He is a certified level two instructor for Korean natural farming. How you doing today, David? Doing great, man. It's good Thanks. to see you, man. Thanks for having me, brother. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Okay, so I have been talking a lot to natural farming. Obviously, I do a lot of organic farming here at my shop. Um, I want to tell everybody that you're with us, the Korean natural farming or KNF is what you hear a lot about. Sure. So I know you're the instructor, so kind of Give us a little background or history on how like KNF was was originated. Cool. Um, so Korean natural farming came to me um, through Chris Trump, which uh, has a ton of YouTube videos. I would definitely suggest you go uh, check out a lot of his videos if, if you're interested in this this tool that that you can use on your farm. Um, Master Cho in Korea uh, traveled to Japan, um, uh, studied under a couple of really uh, regenerative natural. Um, old world style uh, Korean natural or, or, or farmers and um, he basically brought back uh, the technology of, of ferments um, and using that to to um, to get the essence of the plant uh, out and, and, and you do that in a couple of different ways in Korean natural farming and so uh, he basically put this together and uh, taught a small class in Hawaii where Chris Trump happened to live uh, on a huge macadamia nut farm that at the time was failing um, they had a, a quite a bit of crop failure, um, and so Master Cho taught a little class. Uh, Chris, you know, took the class, was very interested, um, uh, struggled a little bit. As it happens, Elaine Ingram shows up, you know, a, a few months later, I guess, and teaches a, um, a microscope class, and really got Chris uh, really more intentional on what he was doing and, 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 um, and what these processes were scientifically, not as much just what Master sure. Cho taught him. Didn't you tell me too that he like used that practice on that macadamia nut farm that so, it had like harvested in forever? Yeah, yeah, so he did. And so they, they had this huge crop failure. I'll just kind of tell his, his little quick story of how he got in it. But they, they kind of had a huge crop failure on 750 acre macadamia nut farm. And um, uh, basically lost the farm. I think they sold off pretty much all the equipment. They moved from the farmhouse to like one of the worker trailers. Um, they, they had to lay off pretty much every employee they had. Um, kind of last minute crop insurance came in and um, they hired back a skeleton crew, a couple of pieces of equipment, and they started uh, farming. Uh, I'm probably gonna get it wrong. I think it was about 30 acres or so. Um, and it was, it was the conventional side, I believe, that they started farming. The stuff that they had let go, um, started to come back to life okay. and, and so that's kind of what what kind of created uh that thought process that maybe maybe we're the ones that are kind of messing this up a little bit that's right when master cho came to town taught korean natural farming um like i said he he, he failed at that really at first he sprayed a bunch of trees with some uh with some, or didn't spray i'm sorry he applied uh imo4 to a bunch of trees that the local university made kind of in a study for Korean natural farming, and it it wasn't good. It wasn't good IMO four. Okay. It was very very uh, anaerobic, very bacterial dominant, um, and so it made his tree sick, and it, and it liked to kill him. Okay. And and that's when Elaine showed up, and Chris went, "Hold on, if, if I'm doing this, I can't trust that other people are making this stuff correctly. I have to figure out how to make it." Um, and, and he really dove in at that point. Um, and, and he's a, he's a pioneer in, in Korean natural farming. Uh, liquid IMO, which we'll talk about later, he, he single-handedly created. Um, everybody on the island was failing at IMO 4 because they were trying to make it how you make it in Korea. Well, it's, it's right. different. You, so, so every uh, bioregion, every environment, you have to adapt to these practices. This isn't a universal across the, the board. It will work everywhere. Sure. Well, that's kind of like the one thing you first taught me when we talked about this was IMO stands for Indigenous Microorganisms. So as he's saying in Hawaii, whether it's there, it's Korea, it's North Carolina, you know, we're going to have different microorganisms. So yes. that's what he's saying. We got to adapt that to that. Which yes. is, that's awesome. I mean, it makes sense. At least he went through the, the failing process to understand like, well, this is how you have to do it. Yeah, he, he failed a lot in his stories, which is awesome because you learn from your failure, and I think that's something that uh, you know. We as humans try to hide. We we get embarrassed that we fail or that we oh, mess yeah. up, and um, you know, talk about your failures and post your failures, and and that's where everybody learns. And so, it's a, uh, yeah, it's 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 really it's it's cool that he got to do all of that, and we just get the benefit of his failures. <laughs> he like, sorry, sorry, buddy, but you know, 
<laughs> that worked. No, absolutely. Now that's that's really cool. So we got a little history about it because, like I was telling everybody, I know I know this much about K and F. This gentleman right here knows this much, and I learned all the time from him. So you just got back from a class out in yep. California. Yeah. Um, so yeah. why don't you just tell? Let's tell a little bit about the class because this is okay. really interesting to me. And then from there, let's kind of talk about well how we're going to yeah kind of K and F from there. Cool. Um, so. To, to, to kind of back up a little bit, I took a class last August in Boise with Chris, um, just a five-day intensive class. Um, I highly suggest that if this is your thing, uh, no, no amount of practicing at home will, will get you the, the benefit that taking that five-day class will get you. Um, your nose knows is kind of a goofy saying, but you really train your nose to the smells of natural farming. Um, everything, smell, and taste is generally your senses that you're going to go with. Um, so ultimately it's a five day class where he goes through all of the inputs, he goes through all of the IMO process, um, shows you how to make it, you make it yourself, um, really gets in depth with the philosophy um, and with application, uh, which is something that's kind of missed on the videos online a lot. Um, and so that was, that was a class I took last year, so I was, that, that's where I've got my certification from. Um, this year I, I got to go back as a soul smith, which means I kind of help teach the class. Oh, cool. And so we kind of get the behind the scenes version of helping set up class, you know, all of the, all of the day's work it takes to put on one of those classes. And so, but I, I took probably 15 pages of notes this year oh, of wow. the exact same stuff that I learned last year <laughs> because, you know, it's like, it's like watching that movie twice. You see, you see some more stuff the oh, second yeah, time. Absolutely. And so, um, it, it's, it's a great learning process and it's, uh, it's really, it's really fun when you're around that many like-minded people. Everyone's regenerative. Everyone's organic in some way, usually when they come into that space already. Oh, that's so. awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a blast. It is a blast. It's a good time. Grass Valley was, uh, was a very great location. Um, you, can, you can imagine being in the middle of California is always a great place to talk about farming. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's, uh, the climate it, had to be amazing It's beautiful. There. A absolutely beautiful, yeah. The, the, the dryness was a little... Uh, you know, intense for someone from North Carolina, but uh, it was yeah, it ch 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 <laughs> and like you know, chugging water all day yeah, just I, just to not be dehydrated, oh, sick, no. and the humidity's so, ridiculous around here. Yeah, it's tough around here. It's tough, and so absolutely. All right, so let's break down the process of just kind of how to start IMO because that's cool. as he was telling me you know IMO is that's everything you know that's, that's like 80% of KNF Korean natural farming 80% 80, 80 IMO for sure yeah and so uh, kind of like we were talking about um, everywhere has like a bio region um, and so you have a, a different selection of microbes depending on exactly where you live and so um, you know where we are today I'm about 30 minutes away to the farm that IMO collection would work, but ideally I would have a collection from this 30 minutes away location and a collection from my farm, and then possibly from one at a higher elevation. And so to break that down, the way we're gonna get collections is we wanna take um, rice, because it's a, it's a cheap, um, easy food uh, uh, for microbes. And so we're gonna take the rice, we're gonna cook it just a little undercooked called El Dante, um, we're going to take that, let it dry out, put it in a, a box, that, a collection box that if you watch a video that Chris has online, you can uh, see kind of this more in detail. We won't go completely into detail today. Um, put, that, put that box on a good collection site. Collection site's going to be somewhere that we find a good patch of like mycelium, um, you know, usually around like an old growth tree. Um, if you're in a real dry area, look for that green space. Wherever the green is, there's mm -hmm. probably some life in the soil. And you're talking about more like that white stuff, like picking up leaves. You, know, you see like that uh, inoculated, where it's like white yeah. and fuzzy, because that's where most of your yep. uh, microorganisms yep. come from. And so, and so the, the, if it's on, on the leaf material, um, it's good. But what, what we really want to find is something that's really in contact with the soil. Okay. Um, and, and so usually if you pick that, that covered leaf material up, just right in the soil, it'll be covered. Um, and it's just, it looks like white roots. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. if, if you can see it, um, it's beneficial uh, in, the, in the microbe space or in the, in the fungi space. And so um, you're looking for as, as much of that white as you can get. You're going to place your box directly in contact with the soil, collect from some areas around you, put it around your box, on top of your box. Um, there's a process there to make sure we get it covered up. We want to keep air space. Um, and so you're going to let that set for, for, depending on climate, five to seven days. 
um, you're going to come back with this nice bloom. And that rice, when you when you pop it apart, you're just going to see all this color, usually a lot of white. Um, we don't want like crazy colors, but you're going to have a little yellow, a little some other color, but but so predominantly like, white. So more like, because I've seen some that have like that pinkish looking color. That's a bad bacteria. Yeah, like, yeah, once you get that far, yeah. you're better off just starting over. Just yes. one of the things to say that white healthy. It's yes. almost like, you know, growing mushrooms. When you yeah, inoculate that lot. soil, it's you you want to say that white furry looking stuff. Sure. Any off colors is usually always an infection and the bacteria gets in there or pr something. Pr pretty much the colors are diversity and then, and then some of the colors, like you say, are bad. You, okay. know, you know what I mean? Pink is definitely a bad one. Red's not good. Um, yellow is basically lactobacillus, and so okay. it's not that big a deal if you have to sure. yellow. Sure, uh, it's just dropping you know, pH a little bit. Yeah, so yeah like a, a, hair, a hair black, a hair, you know, not black, but you just some, some different variations not bad if it's predominantly white. Okay. Um, nothing slimy on the bottom. Um, that's always a telltale sign that it's went bad. Because sometimes the top will look a little gray or black, but it's just where it really bloomed, and then it just has crashed back down a little bit. And so those hairs aren't, aren't actually white, I don't think. They just... Kind of that off way. looking color. Yeah, yeah. And so whenever they compact back down, it kind of turns gray or black. Okay. Um, after you collect this box, that's that's uh, officially IMO one. Okay. That's what you've collected is indigenous microorganisms are now living in that rice. Or, or, or um, so we're going to take that rice. We're going to mix it with brown sugar. That's going to make IMO two. Um, this is shelf stable for, uh, I believe, about six months. Um, you want to keep it just in a cool, dark place. You know, okay. no sunlight. Pretty much all of the the K and F or natural farming stuff is is cool, dark place storage. No sunlight. Um, we will throw a, a few things in the refrigerator to, to help them last longer. Well, that's where. Those cool dark places is where all your microorganisms grow at. So you have to keep it maintained there. You yeah. know, you got to think uh, summertime. You you'll never see microorganisms living on top of anything. Like no. they have to be buried. They have to stay cool. Yep. So that's the Do reason. Like if you're making sunlight. it inside, yep. you're doing it the same way. Because yeah, UVB yeah. will it'll deteriorate and break it them down. Because that's a natural like. What do I want to say? Where it'll kill like pesticide. I mean, yeah. they are insects. Fungicide. Fungicide. Because it's there UVB, like it. because that UVB will break that down. You know, mm -hmm. same way with your like air conditioners. Yep. So yeah, so that's why when she says everything stays cool and dark, yep. is because you're working with those microorganisms, I, which I, is IMO. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I basically take mine and, and wrap um, like colored paper around it, put a paper cap, um, you know, a breathable lid on most of this stuff. Um, paper towel is going to allow a little more air transfer so it's going to dry out quicker mm -hmm. and so I'll use like an actual piece of paper or even like a piece of wax paper. Do you ever have to rehydrate it? Yes. Okay. And so so, so sometimes you will get a little crusty layer on top and you just want to kind of flick water. You don't want to add a bunch of water. Sure. Um, I have not played with this a lot. Um, okay. <laughs> most, most of my collections haven't dried out a lot. We well, usually, once you've got yours established, you just go ahead and, and make your soils with your IMO2, which yeah. is next, which I'm letting you explain this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I know, like I said, I know a little. <laughs> Enough to be dangerous. <laughs> I and so, yeah, so, so my IMO2s, well, ideally, I'm going to have multiple collections. Um, it, as 15 would be great, 20 would be better, right? Okay. Um, three or four is enough. Or, okay, or so you're talking one, about different possible. collection sites out there, is it? Or, or, you're talking or, about or seasons as well. And so, okay. ideally, what I would like to have is a um, winter, fall, spring, and summer collection okay. from spot A, spot B, oh, spot C. And that way I've got the winter microbes of all those spots, you know, all that the way sense. through. Okay. Um, and so then when I'm making my IMO3, like the key to natural farming is diversity. Like, okay. like you, you have to, that's, that's, the, you know, that's the hugest benefit in, in my eyes, is that that diversity means when I put that toward my plant, Whatever microbes are going to gravitate toward that plant are in that. Sure. They're, they're in what I'm what I'm inoculating with, and so um, so we're going to take multiple IMO twos and we're going to make an IMO three. Um, this is basically just where we're propagating more IMOs. You know, we're just, right. We're, so what we're, was your your IMO two? It was just the brown, different color. Oh, okay. Brown, so you're brown, brown sugar, sugar makes it IMO two. Okay. That makes it shelf stable because that's um, where you're adding sugars to feed your microbes, right? Just to kind of keep everything. Put, putting them basically like in cryo freeze. Okay. You, you you basically just like put pause button on everything when you added that sugar. Okay. Um, so so once we've collected our rice, IMO rice one. is IMO one, and then just brown sugar added to it. Now yeah. do you? Pack it around it, do you? Because you don't really want to break it up, you, right? You break you it up break gently, it up. okay? So, so you don't like get really aggressive with it, okay. but you do kind of break it up a little. Um, and, and again, what we're trying to do is just is just put everything on pause. So, so it's filled the rice and it's trying to grow, and we're just like, hold on, stop. Okay. 
And so that way we can pull it out as we need it to, gotcha. to make IMO3. Because it's almost like you're just hitting it with so much sugars and it's like, well, I can only take in so much. I'm going to yeah, stay in this state, basically. Yeah, you said, what, about six months there, life? I think six months. Okay. I think you can maybe even go a year. I would need to just double check that. Um, mine don't make it generally about six months because I usually make two piles. So sure, okay. And that's, you know, by then I'm I'm getting pretty close. So so actually, and you know what? It might be a year or two actually. Um, I should know this. Um, so um, ultimately, there's a little bit of a fermentation process goes on there. Um, outside of that, I, I, I'm not. I think the the sugar just pulls out all of the moisture. Okay. And, and, and which, that makes sense. Which is what kind of freezes the, the microbes or, or puts them in suspension. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're going to do with IMO three is we need a carb, um, a, a carbon and a carbohydrate. Okay. Um, and so a million things will work. Um, originally was taught, I believe, with like rice bran and. Um, probably rice holes or some kind of wheat straw, rice straw or something sure. maybe. Um, but it just didn't really work in Hawaii. It was too humid. It probably wouldn't work here. It's real humid. Um, I find great success with steamed rolled oats. It's basically oat, oatmeal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and then I have a, a local tree guy that dumps dump truck loads of wood chips. And so the wood chips and the oatmeal make a great combo for me. Um, you probably wouldn't want really big wood chips because, um, you, you know, you do want some, you want them to... You don't want it to have huge air pockets, but you also don't want it to go anaerobic. You want okay. to have air in there. So, like, a, a bran is going to be more compact, hold more moisture, less air. Sure. Um, but with wood chips, I think you're getting a lot of aeration. And so a mix of, of oats and bran wouldn't be bad. Um, you just have to see what happens, you know, what works best in your environment. And so we're going to have equal masses of carbohydrate and carbon. We're going to add our IMO2 to this, ju okay. just a... It, it doesn't take much. If you had 50 pounds of each, you're adding, you know, maybe a softball. Okay, so there's a different ratio, yeah. almost like, what is it, like a, a 10 to 1 ratio or, or even uh, smaller than that, of like your IMO to your IO. Uh, yeah, your, your IMO 2 to your IMO 3. Because you're saying you're yeah. using a smaller you're, amount. You're taking just a two, smaller right? amount. I, I don't, there probably is a, a mathematic ratio. Okay. Um, I, I want to say, Chris said the, uh, in class uh, in Grass Valley, he made a 10,000 pound pile and used, I think, five and a half, uh, five gallons or five and a half, five gallon buckets okay. or something like that. I mean, it's 10,000 pound pile. Sure. That's huge. You know? Well, but it's also going to inoculate those oats as well, that IMO. So that's, it's, that's, so what you're doing is just inoculating from that point. It's just, it's taken off. The, the, the IMO too is, is almost, is once you, once you inoculate the pile, it's just, Okay. It just takes off. Right. And so it's 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 similar to like a you know, like a lab mixture we'll talk here here in a minute about. Really the rice wash water just needs to inoculate the milk. That ratio is not as important. Okay. It's just that you've inoculated gotcha. it because the food's there for it and it's just gonna run. Well it reminded me of when I used to grow mushrooms. Like that same thing is once you had those rye berries inoculated, then you would add it to like three or four times more of like a compost or mixture, and then from there it would it's take, all inoculated. It's, it's so then it just starts thing. growing yep. up by the media. Okay, yep. Yep. that yep. makes yep. sense. Exact same thing. And so, um, and so there's a there's a solution uh, that you will, you will put together the inputs, um, the the uh, it's basically maintenance solution, humic acid, seawater, um, and you're going to moisten the pile basically to a fill capacity. Okay. Um, you know, once you get it there, you're going to manage the pile. Look online. There's a lot of detail here that we can't go in on a oh, short show here. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm just of, trying to hit think the, of what the top to say. But, but, uh, but so, so ultimately, you're, you're going to kind of cook this pile um, and keep it within, within a very specific range of temperature, okay. or better yet, not go over it. Uh, a very specific range of temperature. Well, that will start to kill your microorganisms, though, if you get over a certain yeah. temperature. Yeah, and so uh, 127, I think, is really when your anaerobes uh, start to take off. 130s, you know, you're you're pretty anaerobic. Okay. Um, I think even down to like 123, you start to lose diversity. Okay. And so, so ideally, 116, 117, if you could just cook. So how do you maintain that? I mean, it's, I understand, like, I've done compost and stuff, it's like, tough. it's, yeah, it's so, just a lot of... So, we have a little trick that uh, that a, a natural farmer turned us on to last year. Okay. Thank you, Wendy Kornberg, for the barbecue timer. It's amazing. And so, um, we use a thing called a rain bird. There's a million brands. It's got a four-probe thing uh, that you would use for, like, barbecuing or whatever. Well, this one happens to be Wi-Fi. So, Bluetooth is cool, but if it's Wi-Fi, I can be in California and know what my pile's doing. Mm -hmm. And so um, set alarms for temperature alerts, all that good stuff. And so 
once your pile starts to reach certain temperatures, um, we're, we're going to try to turn it to cool it down. And so ultimately the inside of the pile is going to be very hot. It's going to have a lot of action, a lot of life going on. The outside of the pile is going to be cooling down, drying out. Mm -hmm. Those microbes are going to start to cyst up and spoilate. Okay. And so when we put the, nut, the, the, the warm, moist microbes back on the outside, those dry ones back in, everything that's spoilated now comes back alive, gotcha. starts reproducing. And so it's just that cycle. So we want to turn it, uh, you know, roughly every 24 hours, I say for the first couple of days. If it's, if it's cooking good, you know, there's no real need to turn it. Um, just, just let it cook. Um, and so if, if, it's, if it's getting up around that 120 mark, um, we're going to turn it. We're going to play with pile height. Um, to try to cool it down. Okay. Uh, taller pile is going to heat up quicker. It's sure. going to heat up more. Um, you know, I think it's four inches. Anything under four inches doesn't really heat up. Um, really? <clears throat> no. Sure. No, I think like pile about three and a half inches top tall, I, I don't think would really generate okay. any heat. I That's think it's kind of the rule of thumb. And so, Are you adding water back to this just, at all? Just, just the one time. The initial yep. time. Okay. Yep. So we, we, I have um, had piles that did not take off um, because... A really wet pile, you're turning a lot because it's trying to go anaerobic because mm -hmm. there's so much moisture, the oxygen is limited in the pile. That makes sense. And so you're really playing with that moisture level to try to figure out in the beginning um, how many times do I want to turn this pile, how dry can I make it, you know what I mean? And so I had a couple of piles that, that didn't take okay. off. Well, it's um, like anything else, is I guess, even with your classes, it's still trial and error as you go because you're... You're the hands-on because you go out there and you miss a day. I mean, you it's, might be shut out of luck. That stuff could be yes, done for yes, yes. you know. So you've got to stay on top of it. Well, some some guys in class, their their pile shut off. It, it was it, it, it lost temperatures. What I mean by shut off, it's, okay. it, instead of it, it was ambient and down. It, it was never going back up. Um, they added more water, and and then for a day and a half, they fought it going anaerobic the entire time. Okay. Um, so just just like a, a goofy little story here, Chris makes his pile in front of the class. You know, talking to everybody, distracted, asking a million questions. He put he he like made his pile. He turned it at twenty four hours. He never touched it again. It was perfect. <laughs> it was like you break it up and just really? you know chunks of stuff. Uh -huh. And then you got six groups of all of us over Tried here. Don't have pile even look, you know. <laughs> and so when I say trial and error, like I think to speak of Wendy again, I want to say she she failed twenty five times at collecting rice before she had a collection that was good. Um, I failed six times at IMO3 before I had a good IMO3 pile. Uh -huh. um, well, it's like anything else, it's experience. You know, you, I can teach uh, people uh, all the knowledge you could possibly have about mm -hmm. growing plants, you, yep. whether, no matter what kind of plant it is. But until you get in there and you get hands-on, yep. you know, my environment might not be like yours. How am I gonna make everything exactly like you see? But exactly. th that's the problem, exactly. you know? So it's like, you're gonna fail. Different genetics do different things. And it's different like you have to learn. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No, that's that's the key, is, is being able to adapt to your environment. And and this is a tool. This isn't a, a all-in gardening system. This is This is, a tool to use in your garden. Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's really all it is. Um, all, all of that to be said about failure, I've never, I've never grown this easily in my life. I've seen some of your results. Never. It looks amazing. And you just water with a few little other additives we'll talk about here in a little while. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And so I'm, I'm basically, um, I made a, a, a cooch mix, like a super soil, but I have some components in there that are, that are kind of making it a living soil, uh, some mulch, leaf material, um, I do an alluvial layer at the bottom that is um, uh, gravel with a little bit of sand, and so um, it's 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 been really it's mind-boggling the the amount of time that I have on my hands to do things like um, scout, you know, <laughs> yeah. like like uh, really dial in your moisture content because now it's not dry your pot out, so you know it's a different mentality. You know, I want to keep a consistent moisture. So that the life in the bed, um, you know, stays alive and, and, and doesn't have die off when I dry out um, and stuff that like sense. that. So, so it's a little different as far as that goes. But I'm I'm a water only system with the coots mix, um, and then I use some of the K and F inputs that we're you know that we'll get into here here in yeah, a second. Yeah. But um, that, that's kind of it. I want to go back to the IMO three yep. that we were talking about. So. How long of a process does it take? Because you got IMO fours next, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. so on that IMO three, after we've had IMO two, how long 
does that take to cook? You know, you got to keep it at that certain yep. temperature. But how long does it yeah. take? Every every environment is going to be different. Very generally, I'm going to say five to ten days. Okay. Um, five, so it's not like five, months. Five, no, five okay. would probably actually be way too quick. Okay. Um, but, but I would assume somewhere, you know, maybe where it's really warm and dry, that could happen. Um, for me around here, it's usually about 10 days. Okay. Um, you've got about a, a day and a half before you start to see heat. And then you have about four solid days of heat. And then you have about a day and a half or two of cool down. Okay. Um, and so, you know, some, some around eight, nine days, 10 okay. days. Um, and that's just for from start to finish on IMO3. Okay. Well, I've got a, a question. I guarantee mm -hmm. you somebody will have the sure. same question. Can you do this? outside year round or do you have to make it indoors to keep that temperature i know as it cooks so there there is going to be a bottom uh window shelf whatever you want to call it that you would not be able to go and i want to say 40 degrees ish okay is where it's at don't hold me to that um and so ultimately i'm going to be outdoor as long as my lows aren't below say 45 50 degrees okay. so you're not going to be doing december <clears throat> january probably not until mid-february with, with that being said i am about to do an imo three and four pile okay. um only because I, I wanted to do it before class and just didn't get it done um i don't foresee having any problems um the microbes are creating a ton of heat i know it will affect it okay. i know it will slow it down and probably prolong the pile but I don't think it will affect the quality of my body. Okay. Well, which makes sense for a slowdown. It's mm -hmm. like, even in, in brewing beer, you know, that yeast Same is too thing. cold. You got yep. that sluggish fermentation. So temperature yep. always matters in, in some sense like yep. that. Yep. Same thing. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So, all right. We got our IMO3 out. Okay. So you said you were getting ready to do both. So obviously you've got time. I mean, with it, I mean hell, we're in October. You know? Yeah. You, 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 I we think you'll be fine with that. Yeah, we got plenty But, of time. so what's that next process getting into the IMO4? So with IMO3, basically we have collected our indigenous microorganisms and we've taken them like 10,000 generations in the future. Okay. Because they're just, they're just in that pile just, just mm -hmm. having babies. Um, if we put that directly into our soil, um, uh, it would be similar to like, just like the army showing up and, and all of us would be like, you know, whoa, like, why are y'all here? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, even though you're kind of here to help maybe, but it's just like, <laughs> you've got a lot of guns and you're powerful and why are you here? Yep. And so, um, and so what we do then is we take the IMO3, again, equal size piles. Okay. So this is unlike the IMO2 to 3, where it's a smaller amount of IMO2 to IMO3. So, yeah. So, so, so the process here to think of would be your, your carb to carbohydrate ratio, uh, I'm sorry, your carbon to carbohydrate ratio, and then we just inoculate that with IMO2. Yep. And then the next one is the IMO3 to native soil. Okay. Same size piles, but we don't need to inoculate this again because IMO3 has already been inoculated, gotcha. so we're good here. We're going to mix up the same uh, solutions uh, or the same inputs to make that solution that we've moistened it with, same kind of fill capacity of moisture, cook it the same way, same temps, no difference. Okay. Same amount of time? S Similar. It's going to be similar. This pile is probably going to be a little more aerated because you've got a lot of native soil in there that's probably helping okay. uh, your aeration. Um, and that's just my opinion, but but um, it's relatively the same. Not, not a lot of difference there. Um, but now when I go to put that IMO4 out, kind of my native soil is going, hey, look, it's our buddies. And they've got this army with them. They're coming to help us. And so you, you have less of a of a transition shock, if you will, okay. uh, whenever you put that on your beds or in your pots or, or whatever that may be. Um, and because I know some people may be indoor um, gardening here, uh, huge reason we use native soil is because we want the life in that native soil. We want more microbes. We want the nematodes, the arthropod, uh, arthropods, all that stuff in there. Um, so if you're growing indoor, let's do like 25 or 30 percent your coots mix or whatever soil you're using. Uh, well, we'll have to talk about what's in coots too, just so we get an idea yeah. too. Yeah, so co co coast of Maine bag soil, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever, gotcha. whatever, whatever okay. you're using um, it, it to, for, to grow your, your indoor potted mm -hmm. plants in, but then put like 60 percent native soil in there okay. so that you're getting that life. I because again, this isn't what you're going to grow in as a medium. This is what you're then going to inoculate that medium with. I got you. And so we'll get into that, but very small amounts of IMO4 or 3 um, to, to inoculate like a, a bed. You know, a 4 by 8 bed is like a solo cup okay. or 2. Yeah, you know, I probably put 3 because you can't overdose, and I'm an American, and it's, let's, let's make it better. Sorry, I had to do it. Of course. Um, so I, I get questions too. Like I know with 
like like we were saying, uh, Coast Maine, their stony mm -hmm. tulip is a fantastic soil. It's almost yep. considered like a living soil. Yep. But if I'm in a five gallon container, I'm not going to make it through veg and through flower. You know, I might get two to three weeks in. <clears throat> so is it that same concept where you need to be in 15 gallon containers? Or I know you, we talk about raised beds as yep. well indoors. Yep. But what are your thoughts on that? So from um, people much smarter than me, 65 gallons is what I've heard is the is the smallest amount of, of soil that can be considered living. Okay. So any anything smaller than that, uh, the concept is is that you're going to have so much die off because of the dry out that you sure. you're you're really just die off inoculate die off you, so you don't really get the the living soil benefit. Mm -hmm. You're not getting the nutrient cycling. You're not getting all that stuff that you would. Um, and so 65 gallon or smaller, um, I think you have super soil that you're that you're watering you know that whatever and like you could probably you know if you had let's just say this mix I, you're almost going to treat it just like we would anything else so let's mm -hmm. say we've got a small gardener that's doing like a four by four tent you know let's yep. say he throws six five gallon containers in there yep. but he are we going to be at that same thing or you're going to substitute more of the other k and f methods with it or are we still going to have to feed that soil <clears throat> you're, you're, it, so the benefit of the life is that it's gonna it's gonna help you with rock water retention. It's gonna help your um, amendments or nutrients that are in the soil um, be more readily available or bioavailable to the plant, which should mean that there is uh, they last longer. They, okay. they should, you should get better performance out of it because the plant's not it's not being forced on the plant um, like it would be like in a bottle new or something like I that. I got you. And so. Um, but but ultimately, like if you're in a four before ten, I would I would just suggest this do a four before bed. Like okay. like getting live. How 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 deep do you do your beds? So my beds are pretty deep. Um, I have an eight foot ceiling. I'm probably twenty three inches deep. Okay. Oh, so you got a good yeah. That's a good amount of soil. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's it, there is some cost when setting this up um, with a coots mix or a super soil um, or a horizontal bed, which we may or may not even get into here, but. Um, you'll buy this soil like once every 10 or 15 years. Okay, so, so you can keep just regrowing in that same soil. I'm, do you take like your roots and everything out or does those microorganisms break that, everything down there? That's food. So Source of carbohydrates? Food, yes. Okay. And so I'm on the third run of a five by five um, that has had wood chips added to the top, compost added to the top, and I'm growing rye because I'm, nitrogen, I'm, I'm fighting nitrogen toxicity okay. on still my third run. Oh, wow. It's toxicity. Toxicity. <laughs> wow. I'm feeding calcium to my plants. Just, I'm getting just a little, and then the calcium just goes, okay. You know? And so, yeah. It was some, it was, it was some, it was some, I mean, I get a little bit of like this. Just barely. Okay. Just, just a little barely. Down, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, And so you throw a little calcium, it's not like really helping the plant other than it's not, it's not stunting it. Okay. Because it's not thinking nitrogen toxicity mode. It's just kind of you know leveling itself yeah. out a little bit, balancing and itself out. I heard you say you plant rye. So now is rye going to naturally help either break down eat, or does it take eat, up the eat nitrogen? Up that nitrogen. Yep. Okay. Yep. And the same thing with different cover crops. Yep. You know, they're going to add either more nitrogen to sure. more phosphorus sure. or something like that, yeah. which is a topic we'll dive in onto another day because there is so that's, much yes, out there about yes. that. But that's exactly why I planted rye, and and, and I am less hot now. As I, okay. this is the second run with rye. Um, and when I say up there, it's it's patchy. It's you know I keep it cut down and I'll go in there and pull it out. Sure. You know, uh, kind of simulating an animal digging around okay. your plants. Okay. Um, you know what we're doing is we're mimicking nature. Sure. Look in the woods. Things grow beautifully in the woods. They're not yes, diseased. They're, they're not covered in bugs. Mm -hmm. You know. And that's another thing. You don't have to spray even pesticides either. No pesticides. And so um, I am finding now my first pest pressure that I have had. Um, I started another room. Um, in some 25 gallon pots. Okay. Um, had some aphid issues, uh, you know, nothing I couldn't take care of, but had some aphid issues, transferred them into the room with my living soil beds, um, saw just a couple of little pest pressure on the, on the leaf material, um, and then it was gone. Really? I never, I never sprayed a thing. I'm in there. I'm like, I know they're here. I see, you know, I see where you've been on my know, leaf, you know? Exactly. Nowhere yeah. to be found. Well, I, well, that's another thing that I liked about that because I remember you telling me that story about mm -hmm. there was a plant, uh, just a cannabis plant out. What was it like, California, wherever it, it was? It, but it was Oregon. Yes. Yes. Spencer Karen with Royal Flush Farms. I highly suggest you follow him. I know none of his tag information. I should. Spencer Karen on Facebook or probably Instagram's the same. 
uh, did a podcast with Drake in Hawaii uh, um, and told a story about one of their first gardens after after learning K and F. Um, they had a plant that the, the, the entire plant was just falling over and just completely covered in web. Um, and when they harvested that plant and kind of dug it out, there was no damage to the plant. The, 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 spider, the spider mites were literally trying to kill the plant by webbing it mm-hmm. because they couldn't penetrate the plant. That's um, he has a very unique, uh, it's not unique, he follows this philosophy true to heart. Um, we toured his garden. He's just a, a little ways hour out of that class in Boise that I took, and so the whole the whole class went out there for a barbecue one night. Oh, cool. um, he's got a plant that has russet mites. He has a plant that has spider mites. The other ninety plants are phenomenal, and we're yeah. like, well, what do you why are He said, are they on the other plants? Like, <laughs> just a bug. It's like the sacrificial he's plant. Like, the bugs on the other plants. <laughs> they don't have this one. Like who cares? Exactly. You know. And, and that's his mentality. I mean, he, he went to mix some stuff and, like, broke a bag out that was, like, covered in all this, what I would have thought was just, like, gross stuff. And he's like, but the microbes that I just brewed are more powerful than what's on that bag. That and it's like, sense. I'm not worried about that little bit on the bag. Okay. You know? and so no, that makes sense. He, he really he really follows it to heart. But that was, that was a story that opened my eyes on kind of um, how powerful healthy plants are. Yeah, no, I, I agree, especially if you it's have insane. a spider mite infested plant and if you're feeding it its natural microorganisms, yeah. it can fight off yeah. just like your immune system can help fight off that. <laughs> that's what that plant's doing. Yeah. No, that's that's really cool. I found the life um, is is like a it's just like a regulator. I, I can go in, had an air conditioned problem, I was in veg, uh, room's ninety one degrees, plants are praying. I, I, don't, I don't mean like, you know, they're happy like, like this. They're like I mean, these damn things are like this, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I go in and the humidity's through the roof, they're praying. I go in, there's no, the beds are dry as crap, they're praying. I go in there, you just pick up the soil and it's just like, man, it's getting a little funky, it's too wet. They're praying. It's That's just the amazing, life man. overcomes okay. so much. Well, it's just got to have to be all of those microbes. And especially with you doing them, you know, every season mm-hmm. because... Like, you're not going to have the same ones in the summer that you are in the winter nope. because those are going to die off. And yep. So you've got everything this yep. plant could possibly and, want. And that diversity is key because, like you say, what what is not going to thrive in that particular environment will just die off. Yeah. And, and, and what is, will, you know, will take off. And mm-hmm. so, and, and I inoculate a lot. So I spray, <clears throat> next step to, to IMO process is, um, is actually IMO5, but we'll skip to LIMO because I spray once a week with liquid IMO. Um, so I take an IMO two, three, or four, not a five. I'll tell you about five in a second. Um, I I use four. That's ideal, uh, I believe. Um, and I brew basically basically a liquid IMO. I liquefy the IMO okay. basically in a compost tea or like a, a active air uh, aerated tea. Um, what you, how long do you bubble for? Uh, Thirty six hours typically, but again we're looking for a smell. And okay. so, if it's 76 degrees consistently, about 36 hours on the nose. Okay. Um, as that temperature varies, so will the time. So, is it the smell you don't want? Obviously, is going to be more rancid, correct? Or is it get to this point? And if it keeps going longer, it gets to to that. It, it, it will get worse, but there's a certain smell that is your peak performance. Okay. And so, a little before is okay, a little after is okay, but but you're actually looking for a for a very specific point. Um, it's a window. So, you know. so I take it you can't listen off YouTube? I mean, you can't smell can't, it off YouTube? Even if I had it here. Well, one of those things, you, yeah. you got to get in there, take you know. Class, <laughs> um, so we will be doing one-day classes soon and, and possibly a day at the farm. I know some three-day classes around here next year. Cool, man. Um, but anyway, so so you spray that liquid IMO. I try to spray that on my plants like once a day. Uh, I'm sorry, once a week. Uh, brew it every seven to ten days. Okay. Um, with that, I could add in that calcium product we were talking about, or if I needed like a, a fish amino acid, which is going to be my nitrogen source and my amino acids, or uh, WSK, which is like your potassium or um, your calphos for changeover, whatever you needed to add, I can put in that limo okay. when I spray that on my plants and soil drench on that plant. On my plant. So how long is it stable? Or you need to use instantly. It? Okay, so, so, it's, so, it's fine. So, you're not going to throw it in the fridge nope. and, get, and keep on to it. Nope, so you nope. need to instant dial. So you need to make the amount that you need mm-hmm. because otherwise you're just going to toss it somewhere. Else. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so what I do is I typically make four gallons, no matter well, unless I'm making a bigger batch. I make four gallons, no matter what. Um, I'm not sure the success of less than that. Like, okay. I wouldn't try to brew a gallon. 
Okay. I'm thinking there's just not enough there to, to get action. See that. And so um, I soil drench. Whatever, whatever I don't spray, I just soil just drench. And we all have a tree, you know, we all have oh, something outside well, that, you you know, that would really, really benefit from, from that. And so Now, watering, I know on a typical water, like just say I'm in the, the seven gallon mm -hmm. containers, mm -hmm. I like to water until I get some runoff. Mm -hmm. So now on a bed, are you in that same point? Or are you trying to mm -hmm. keep a certain moisture level in there? Mm -hmm. So so ideally, I want an extremely consistent moisture level um, because, again, any dry off uh, or, or the more the soil dries, I'm going to have die off of my, of my microbes. Okay. My diversity is right. going to die. Um, so then only the and, – and to some extent, things are going to cyst up and things are going to spoilate. And so, so die off is, is maybe not the correct term, but – but you're going to have a lot less diversity, and everything won't come back in the strength that it was. Okay. Um, and so, so with the with the pot, you're going to let it dry off enough that you would be able to water and get runoff. In a bed, you're you're probably going to be heavily saturated. I think before you get any okay. any real runoff. Um, I use a blue mat um, that that top waters. I find in the bed that is mostly coots mix mm -hmm. that is sufficient. I don't add water. To the bottom of the bed stays nice and, and moist. Okay. Um, the bed beside it, I have a mulch layer, a leaf layer. Um, the blue mat's not sufficient. It's great for top watering. About once a week, I'm hitting it with about five gallons of water, okay. just to kind of do like a deep water on it. That makes sense. Um, but those, that, so those, you know, there's there's not a big difference in um, the way the plants are reacting as far as is um, only deep watering once a week doesn't seem to. I seem to have, be keeping a, a consistent moisture t uh, moisture uh, capacity throughout the, okay. the the grow that it's not really I'm not having issues with dry soil or, or plants wanting water. Or anything but that's like what that. I was curious about, just yeah. because you know typically if we were just growing in just soils, you know you can't just keep that stuff wet because you no. have the chances of root rot and yep. all this stuff. Yep. But I guess with as many <laughs> microorganisms and everything in there, they're probably breaking down that dead root material anyways. Yes. Almost like enzymes that they're yes. probably already living in your soils like that. Yes. So that, okay. That makes yeah, a whole lot more definitely sense. Definitely starting to break that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's just more food source for them too. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. I've not had a root ball issue. I okay. was worried about that in the beginning. I, I've planted it. In, I, I lay the bed out per what plants I want to put in. Sure. And I've, I've not had an issue. Okay. Like I, I've, I don't think I've tried to plant directly on top of a plant. <laughs> you know, but I mean, the, the roots are still there sometimes, but they're not, you know, by the time you harvest, and give that bed a week or two to chill, mm -hmm. a lot of that root mass is already broke down. down. Yeah, it's getting broke down. No, that makes sense. <clears throat> so I'm 05, not to, not to leave everybody hanging there, that's basic, basically going to be where you're going to add in. Um, so that I'm 04, which is your native soil, your I'm 03, all of that life. Now we're going to add in, say, like a compost or a manure or something like that. Okay. So now this is where I'm going to feed something to my soil as far as my plants as far as like a um, if I'm deficient in anything mm -hmm. that's what I could add to my IMO5 I got then you. when I top dress with my IMO5 I'm putting in that nitrogen or, or whatever I'm, I'm lacking that gotcha. I and that's going to be some additives we're going to talk about here in just a little bit about yeah. other ways because like we were saying IMO that's why we've talked so much about IMO is that is <laughs> everything and there will be other additives that we can do we can make in house and talk about all those fun things so I know, so we're talking about like the way the IMO four or five is how everything, how each one of these pieces work together. Mm -hmm. So on average, let's just get an idea, like just so everyone knows, like how long is it going to take me from the time I take my rice, I build that first IMO one until I can actually, well, IMO four is where I would say, because that's right. where you're going to start playing. Like IMO yeah. five is if you're trying to fix like sure. a, a, a deficiency. Sure. It's, it's useful, but it's it's less used. I've never made an IMO five. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I haven't done that yet. And so. You're somewhere around 25 days, probably on the long end, because you're you're going to make your rice. Your box is going to be that five to seven days. So we'll just call that a week. Okay. Um, and then you're about seven to ten days each process. IMO three and four. So if we go long side, ten days each, we're 27 days okay. or so. So that's so not that's not, that's not bad. terrible. No. And then especially if you have multiple piles where you just keep, especially if you're a perpetual grower where yeah. you need stuff ready all the time. Well, and you use so little of this. So what, what ideally you would do would be to make your IMO3 pile a pretty big one that you can store and then just use a portion of that IMO3 to make enough IMO4 to put out on your garden. 
Gotcha. And when you needed more IMO4, you just pull it. So every 10 days, I can be pumping out IMO4 okay. pretty easily. So you're not stuck making a 30 no. day process every single time because you're only using so yeah. amount of this one. Okay. Yes. And then, of course, sense. you take your IMO2 or 1 and 2 process out of that after you do a couple of collections because, again, they're shelf stable for That's right. a while. Okay. So you, it's, it's, it sounds very time consuming. I have an older brother that, that really like gives me a hard time. That sounds like so much work. And I'm like, but it's just not. It does sound like it, but it's like when you start you doing it, it's yeah, it's just not that much work, and so. All right, man. So all right, we got IMOs out of the picture now. Like that was it. So we were talking about some of the other additives. One that, as we've talked to before, what I really like is calcium, mm -hmm. because I know you've got a few methods of making like just readily available calcium. Sure. So how do you sure. go about that? We'll, we'll go through the in inputs. Um, so WCA, water soluble calcium. Um, the the one way is to take eggshells. Uh, we want to cook them or brown them. Um, we want to get rid of that little membrane that's kind of on the inside okay. of the shell. That's just put it in like just like a pan. Frying or? pan. Okay. Just, just, a, just a frying pan on a grill or something, okay. and just 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 fry it up. You're you're really looking for a real tingy kind of crisp breaking sound. Okay. Um, you're you're cooking all organic matter out. That's ultimately what you're doing. Um, all, what the organic matter is going to do if it's left in is just cause cause your finished product not to be shelf stable because um, uh, it, it'll rot. It, it'll it'll create rot. Um, once you once you cook all the eggshells to the uh, to that uh, really brown crisp, you're going to add that to vinegar at a certain ratio. Watch the video. You have to be careful here. Adding vinegar to the eggshells will will create a mess if you're not careful. Well, so question there, because I do know that we've got horticultural vinegar, we've got just regular vinegar that has the acetic acid that does it. So does it matter what percentage? Because what, I think typical house vinegar is like, what, 2%, I think? I'm not 100% sure okay. on that, but, but you can use pretty much any, say, like store-bought vinegar. It okay. doesn't have to be a living vinegar here. Gotcha. Um, preferred, always a living vinegar, but if you bought like a, like a, you know what is a White House or Bragg's yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever it is, just a regular vinegar. That's 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 acceptable so here. Um, I I would try to use a living vinegar always. Okay. Um, but brown rice vinegar or, or or apple cider vinegar might be pretty expensive for making some of these inputs. So you're talking, are you talking about making your own with like your, your mother or your because you, you, that's how you make them. It's you, like that has can, a mother yeah, for your vinegar and yeah. keeping all that stuff. Going. You can so so brown rice vinegar would would be um, Korean natural farming kind of preferred best because it has some micronutrients. Anything outside of that, you would want to use a living vinegar like an apple cider vinegar. Okay. Um, once you, we get into making FPJs, the leftovers there can be turned into vinegar. Okay. Um, so so just any anything that's kind of a a natural vinegar or living vinegar. And the reason I, I say it that way is. Is the stuff in the bottle? We don't know how it was made. If it's a petroleum-based vinegar, we don't want to use it. Okay. And so, and so that's really the only dodgeball there. That's why we want to say if you're living or, or some sort of grain vinegar, we know how it was made. Gotcha. That um, makes sense. And so the product you're going to end up with is is water-soluble calcium. It's 100% bioavailable to the plant. Um, instant uptake. I mean, you 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 instantly see results. Now, what's obviously it's got to be a dilution ratio, right? Yes, and so we're about four milliliters per gallon. Okay, um, I believe so it's one to one to five hundred. Out, yeah. Is it you? Well, no, I guess it's usually three to five on some of the cow yeah. mags that yeah. I see. So yeah. okay, so basically it's, making a more healthy, efficient besides using like calcium nitrate. So sure, like you're using like sure, and and, and it's going to be bioavailable. As that stuff, if I'm not mistaken, will still have to be broken down a little bit. Okay, I'm not sure how that. I'm not a hundred percent sure how available that is. Um, like instantly, um, but yeah. So so that's WC. I guess we'll just start at the top and kind of go through the list. Okay. Um, fermented plant juice. Um, you know, we want to get like a, a new growth tip on a plant. Uh, the main reason for that, um, and we want to get it early in the morning before the, the sun gets on it. The main reason is for that is that at night, um, uh, the the tree or the plant or whatever it it shoots all of its uh, enzymes and, and yeast and, and biology to the tips for growth. And then, then during the day, as the sun comes out, that stuff all gets shot back down to the roots to trade for the microbes for stuff that it needs the next night to grow. See, that's another thing. If you, you know, you weren't with somebody that knew this knowledge, yeah. you could be out there and, and be wasting your time at the wrong, picking at the wrong time. I, I have some recent uh, semi students of mine that have made about three or four FPJs, not in the morning, and can't figure out why it's not working. <laughs> and I'm, you know. Your yield's going to be less okay. if, if you get it just in the middle of the day. You're you're getting something, but you're just not really getting what we're after. Okay. And now does it, I, I know that different plants, depending on what we're going, it's going to have different nitrogen and things like that, but are we just picking, 
are we picking certain plants or are we just kind of just wanting to get because there's more enzymes available that that's what sure. so it doesn't matter what plants we go with sure so so there's there's two trains of thought here original k and f no none of that stuff matters i want uh three 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 rules um invasive like just wild growing you want something that's very strong um, no contact with man. I don't want to use something that I have been growing or fertilizing or maintaining, and then we don't want it to be poisonous. Okay. That's it. And so the uh, most vigorous plant on your property is going to make the best FPJ regardless of its contents. Okay. Um, because what we're looking for um, is the, et the, the life of the plant. If it's thriving on your property, then it has the biology that that needs to be present on a plant to thrive in your, on your property. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And so, so you're just you're just you're just really adding sugar um, to just suck the essence of that plant out okay. into a liquid form that the, you're then mixing at about that same four milliliters a gallon. Um, and now, what is this going to increase? Is it the enzymatic activity? Yep. Is that that's all? Yep. Okay. That's that's mainly what. Okay. So that's what FPJ is. Yep. Prevent plant juice is enzymatic activity. Pretty okay. much. Yep. yep. Okay. Pretty much. Um, and so then we have an, an FFJ, which is a fermented fruit juice, exact same process, everything's the same, um, except for there we're using a, a ripe or overripe fruits, um, and that's going to be for a ripening solution. Um, okay. I am uh, talking with someone that I met in Grass Valley that actually uses FFJ throughout most of his flower um, and is having amazing results. Um, the knowledge that I have previous to this gentleman is that FJ, FFJ is not really anything to use in hip or cannabis that it, that it has very little benefit. Um, so still still on the fence with that one. Um, if Master Cho made it, it has a purpose. That's so what I would say. what do you think it's doing? Because I know... So if I take an FFJ, I'm going to have all of that stuff that I just told you wasn't important in FPJ <laughs> in that FFJ. Okay. I'm going to have a lot more phosphorus. I'm going to have a lot more potassium. Sure, because it's a bloomed have. flower. It's not that vegetative right. grows. And it takes phosphorus, potassium. To it's also going to have that grows. enzymatic profile of the fl fruiting. Okay. So there, there's a lot to it. Like I said, if, if, if it's in the plan, I'm going to use it. Sure. I, I think I think it's important. Now, is that more be watered in? Do you spray any of these? Mm -hmm. Oh, you all can. You can spray and so, and feed them in. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so all of this is is a foiler and a soil drench. Okay. Of, of all of it. Um, and this is when you're mixing in with your IMO liquid. You're mixing, or is it a separate application? So there, there's. I, IMO is kind of its own process, and, and, then, and then these are the um, inputs that we can make solutions out of. Um, and so these are the inputs that we make that liquid that we mixed with the IMO mm -hmm. three and four. Um, so that's what you're adding in, in like yeah, a, a feeding, watering yeah, slash. Yeah. So that tea that you brewed for like 36 hours, you're going to add the FPJ, All FFJ that, into that yes. at the same time. Okay. Yes, yeah. When I put my IMO in there, I'm adding that stuff because I'm adding food gotcha. and medicine and stuff like that. Okay. And so, and so the FBJ and FFJ are, are really simple. Um, the next one that's not so simple is OHN. Um, uh, there's five, um, five herbs that go into this. Um, garlic, ginger, angelica root, licorice root, and cinnamon bark. So what does OHN stand for? Oriental Herbal Nutrient. Okay. And so um, this is a process, look online, I, I can't even come close to explaining it all right here. Um, you end up with this tinctured uh, um, liquid that is basically a medicine. And so um, all of those are antipathogenic herbs. All of those are warming herbs. Um, this is a big play on Chinese medicine. Okay. Um, all of these are very big in, 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 uh, in that world, in that space. And so um, this is basically what you're going to put on your plant that's going to help with, with circulation. Um, it's going to help fight off uh, pathogens and disease. Okay. Um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a health tonic. It's an immune booster. Almost it's, like PMs and balancing off all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, well. okay. yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. And so and so that with FPJ and then BRV, which is brown rice vinegar. Again, app, any living vinegar, any non petroleum based vinegar okay. works here. Grain vinegar is better because it does have that minor nutrient profile. Gotcha. Um, those three combined are what we call our maintenance solution. Okay. So you're going to take say a five gallon bucket of water. You're going to add FPJ 1 to 500, BRV 1 to 500, and OHN 1 to 1,000, and that's a maintenance solution. Okay. I can spray that on any plant as much as I want. I'm going to tell you not to do it every water because you're going to make your plant drunk. You're giving it way too much sugar. But I gotcha. every 
other water every three or four days, okay. I think you're fine. And that's just with water. That's not with just like water. that. Nope, this is nope, what you're just throwing water. in there. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just water. And so, go ahead. I was gonna say. So before we just get all of these out here, okay. So the FPJ, FFJ. Mm -hmm. How long is that fermentation go for? Uh, about five to seven days. Okay. Yep, so yep. it's not a long process. Nope. It's available sooner than later, and it's yes. got, a, I guess, a shelf life on it. For it it does uh, about six months to a year. You're okay. gonna keep that in the refrigerator. That's one of them we refrigerate. Um, there's a process of super saturation that if you just had to keep it in like your grow room or garden or whatever. Um, I discourage it. It is way too much sugar. Um, you have a refrigerator. Like, okay. Put it in your sure. refrigerator. Okay. So you use such a small amount of this. Um, just just put it in your refrigerator. It'll be a better product for your plant. Gotcha. So the OHN with all the different roots is it also going into the, the vinegar so, base and breaking down in there? No. No. So so OHN um, it, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a very long process. You're gonna have three dried herbs. You're gonna add beer to to rehydrate. You're gonna you're gonna really crush up your garlic and your ginger. You're gonna ferment those with brown sugar, just like you do FBJ. Okay. And then you're gonna start a vodka or or a, a, a more of an ethanol base. A higher a higher percentage alcohol okay. tincture. Um, and so um, that's a process of of um, adding vodka to that ferment, and then stirring it every day for 14 days. Okay. Pouring a, a third off, start adding vodka back. 14 days. So so this is a long process okay. that I would just suggest in the five day course. Chris says. Watch the OHN video. I'm not teaching it, but it's like sure, I got it's, it's complicated and, and it's, it's a long process. It's a doing long process, and, and, okay. and so but 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 people will sell you that. I have some for sale. It's easy to find online. Buy it from someone that's taking a hands-on class. And that's the one you said is like a one to one thousand. So one, it takes one to very 1, small amounts of that. And so a lot of these natural inputs on the on the back end here, OHN is one to one thousand for the first year, one to two thousand for the second year. One to three thousand from the third year on. So if I made if I made a big enough batch to make it for like a couple of years, yeah. I'm using a third by the third year. <laughs> so instead of the instead of the four milliliters, the other was eight milliliters. I keep saying four. One to five hundred is eight milliliters. Um, four milliliters, one to a thousand. I will be using like one milliliter. Okay, I got you. Know you. What I'm very saying? small. Yeah, so so it's a min it's such a small amount, and it's just more of a maintenance solution. And so, man, yeah. you can make one, even though that long process takes. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be using it for years, ever. Okay, because yeah. yeah. it's an alcohol I'm, base, so it's really not going to break down you, or anything. Nope, like you don't that. put it in the fridge. You put a, a solid lid on it. The FPJ is always stored with a breathable lid. Um, with this OHN, you're putting a solid lid on it. It's shelf stable. Okay, you know, cool dark place, but you know it's not in the refrigerator. I'm still using the OHN that I finished two years ago. Wow. Yeah. And, and, I, and I've just this year made, I want to say it's a four-gallon batch. And so I'll have OHN for like the next <laughs> long time, you know, because I'm pretty small garden too. So. For sure. So now, I know one other thing. We, we talked about the calcium, the ray leaves calcium mm -hmm. from using just eggshells. Mm -hmm. But I know we talked about, isn't that like a so, bone? That so that's, that's a too? little different to get back on the, to, to jump to it, to get the, back to the water-soluble calcium. Um, you can use, um, I'm going to say it's not crustacean meal. Um, it's basically like shells. It's basically crushed up seashells. Okay. Um, so, so it's any of that stuff that, that the calcium's in. Okay. Um, so the bones are going to be for calcium phosphate. And okay. so it's the same process as the eggshells. We're going to char them, not in a frying pan. Um, I do this in a Dutch oven. Okay. Um, there is a undercooked and overcooked. We're looking for a certain char. Um, it's basically just like, like, uh, like biochar. Mm, okay, um, I got very, you. very similar process, no mm -hmm. different. Um, we're going to add that... Um, is vinegar as well, um, uh, one to ten, ten days. We're gonna strain out solids. Now have water soluble cal uh, calcium phosphate, which is ultimately for our changeover solution. Okay. So, so if I'm a vegetable uh, farmer, and I know by looking at my plants, and I've grown these plants for ten years, and dang it, next week or the week after, I'm gonna have tomatoes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna start giving it cal phos now. I'm gonna have like a million more blooms than I had before. Right, because that's what phosphates do, is they that's open up does. flower sites. Yes, yep. so same thing in, in cannabis or hemp. Mm -hmm. We're fixing to go to flower. Day you flip, hit it with that cow phosphate, okay. you're good. So that's another one you'd already have made up for that yes. as well. Yes. Okay. Shelf stable, 
These aren't shelf stable. I actually thought they were shelf stable for a couple of years. I think it's more like a year. Okay. Um, and so, uh, again, there's a lot of information online that will give you the exact details of this stuff. Or come take a class when I have a million notes in front of me. Yeah, there's no and, way we can talk about it. I feel more confident about it. So, but, uh, but so, yeah, so, so the bones are a good one. They give you that, that calphos. Um, we use tobacco stalks or sunflower heads or stalks for water-soluble uh, phosphate, WSK. Uh, uh, potassium, I'm sorry, WSK, and um, and so those are kind of the three biggies as far as um, your NPK style thinking. One thing that I will say is is um, is I don't think about any of that stuff growing this way. Okay. Um, uh, one of Master Cho's saying is, is come to this with an empty brain or come to this like an infant. Um, that stuff doesn't really apply. No, no, nobody's in the nobody's in the woods thinking, man, I need more nitrogen. No, of like course they not. just find a way to make it work, and so. So the life will find the balance that your plant's looking for. But that being said, you can't go planting dead soil and put, give it life and be like, oh, yeah, it's going to. Right. No. No, absolutely. Okay? But if you're doing soil tests and you're amending, you're not thinking the, 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 the input side of things are for making the IMO, the liquid IMO, the maintenance. You, you're, you're, you're using it because I've got a nitrogen toxicity you know I what I mean? You. But, but yeah, I don't, yeah. those those aren't really getting used a lot. You know what I mean? FAA is another one, fish amino acid. Um, of course, it has the amino acids. It's a huge nitrogen source. Um, just a really, really good mineral uh, product. You're taking, hopefully, uh, deep sea, blue top, um, and there are some different uh, fish that you can use for different parts of the plant's life. Really? Um, making FAA. Um, it's not something I use. Uh, I've given my beds FAA. I gave one bed FAA one time. Couldn't tell the difference. It couldn't tell the difference. Really? And of course, I'm fighting the nitrogen toxicity. I wanted to get the amino acids in there so yeah. that it would help, but um, just not really seeing anything. Well, that's another one you yeah. said it takes forever to make, isn't it? That one's, uh, you can use it after three months. I don't suggest using it until six months, and it's better after a year. <laughs> one year is what you want. And so this is really simple. You go to your local kimonos or wherever they get salmon once a week in a five gallon bucket they cut the good stuff off they put the heads the backbones and everything back in the bucket and throw it in the dumpster if you just go say hey i want to pick that bucket up yeah he'll set like, it to the side for you for it, man. make sure you go get it because if you don't go get it you're not going to get the option again oh, yeah. you know what i mean they're oh, going to be yeah, like no, i'm true. just going to throw it away you're you know yeah. and so you mix that with brown sugar like i said it, in three months you'll have liquid that's usable okay um but six months is better to have to filter any of it out or oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yep yep so i just take a, a five gallon paint strainer mm -hmm. put it in a five gallon bucket dump the five gallon bucket pull out the fish strainer done Easy it's, it's 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 so simple all of this stuff is intentional. It is time consuming. You can't wait to the last minute and go, oh crap, I need some. You're not going to have it. You know, but if you think a little bit and plan a little bit, um, the cost effectiveness of this way of farming is, is there's no comparison. Right. I mean, no, you're naturally no making everything that you could possibly need. It, it's, it's going to revolutionize the way that we farm. Um, I know we hear that a good bit, but there are commercial farms using this practice now that are literally changing the way their industry looks at farming. I bet so, uh, and it creates a better tasting. Every, it, it, everything is so everything. Much the terpene products. profile is insane yeah. with natural farming. Because your plants all, you know, they'll naturally create their own sugars as well. Yeah. So you'll get all that bricks content to those yep. final flowers, just yeah. boutique flowers on those. No, it's it's nice. It's a you know, not 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 to brag on natural farming a lot, but there's there's a vineyard in Napa. If 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 you know anything about, I mean, you probably do about about um, growing grapes. There is no organic uh, PM solution. No, there's there's not. no there's no organic powdery mildew solution no. for for the grape industry. Um, liquid IMO gets rid of it. Really. Um, is it adding like any FPJ or anything like that? To so, it so, too? so, so, what I do in liquid IMO is I make maintenance solution, which is FPJ, BRV, and OHN. Okay. I add that to my water. I put humic acid and I put seawater. And then I put brown sugar and IMO4 in there. Okay. And so um, that's what they're spraying. Um, they're, they're, they are bottling probably last week or this week their first run of all KNF grown wine. Really? Um, I don't think they're going to have enough for what's already been ordered. That's yeah, it's just, it's just people, 
amazing. People are going crazy. Yeah. I can imagine. People are going crazy. Well, you gotta think you get away from all those salts. Yeah, because it's like, how are you gonna flush a grape plant outside to yeah. get those salts? It's not gonna happen. No. So you know, it's gonna have to make a better quality wine. Yeah. I would imagine. It has it's to. It's it's going on everywhere. There's a there's a farmer over in Ireland, uh, Thomas, um, who's a dairy farmer. Um, who I, I will I will kill the percentage of the amount of expenses that he is saving. He's producing a little better quality milk. Um, it's 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 a better uh, milk, but it's selling for for relatively the same price as a, as a normal gallon of milk. Uh -huh. um, but his input cost is like seventy percent down or something. Really? Something. So is, that, is he growing his own, I guess, grains to feed the cows, and then in turn is so he there's a grain create? farmer in Iowa. Mm -hmm. That's literally growing grain with uh, K and F. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? There's a better quality. There's everything. farmers. Uh, every, it, it's it's really starting to make noise um, because you you have healthier. So, Gabe Brown was kind of the first guy that I, I knew of. He's up in New York. If, if any of you guys on YouTube, uh, uh, who really kind of had the concept that if, that if I grow good soil, that's all I have to worry about. Sure. That'll grow good grass. Yeah. That my cows eat, that my you know whatever. So like this is where it starts, and everything else will be healthy after mm -hmm. that. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing. That's okay. what we're seeing people starting to do. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. It's that's the basis of life, you know. Yep. Instead of trying to hit it with all those salts, all those yeah. nitrates, all those phosphates, you're not and chasing. It's, no, it's eventually going to make yeah. your land barren unless you can find something that's going to break those salts down, anyways. I think you know. I think they're saying fifty years on this planet before we'll be out of out of uh, the soil will be completely nuked barely. I can basically. see that. Yeah. yeah, especially with all just the <clears throat> runoffs, the pesticides, man, mm -hmm. everything, man. You get to that point where you can't grow anything no. unless you start to go this route. Yeah. You know, at least this way. You know, the only other thing that I've seen was like, well, inoculants. You, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I don't try to plug things on here with that uh, emerald uh, harvest. They've got mm -hmm. that root wizard. That's like mm -hmm. that army-based inoculant mm -hmm. that will actually break down your carbon, your hydrogen, your oxygen molecules, yep. so that way everything can be taken up. Yep. Yeah, they use that in like gas fills and oil leaks. Yeah. But beside, but it's still an inoculant, so it's still those beneficial. So yeah, that's yeah. the only thing that's going to have a solution. There's a everybody. there's a couple of those, and 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 great products. Don't not knocking any of that stuff. Um, it's just not indigenous, and so it's gonna right. have it's gonna have a fall off. Mm -hmm. it, it's, yeah, it's a absolutely. shelf life in your in your system. It's, mm -hmm. It can't, it can't maintain without you continually inoculating with yep. it. Exactly, and that's the thing is you have to constantly inoculate. Very similar to a to an EM, um, you know, great product, but it's I think I could be wrong, but I think the only thing they guarantee is is lab. Yeah. I think that's the only thing that's really guaranteed on the packaging is is, is lab. Um, which we didn't talk about in the inputs. That's another. Oh yeah, that's another great because you can make that from the original IMO rice water. Right? So when you take your rice and you're going to cook it, you just wash your rice. Which which I, you know, I've never cooked this much rice in my life. But but so when you cook rice, you wash it, and uh, that rice wash water, you set it out. Um, again, there's a certain smell you're looking for. Um, this time of year, you're probably about 30 hours, okay. somewhere around there, maybe 36. Um, once you get that smell. Um, what the rice wash water is, is just a really cheap, easy food for bacteria. All kinds of natural bacteria are going to inoculate that rice wash water. Um, the only thing that I want to live out of that is the um, lactic acid bacteria. So I'm going to take milk, any kind of dairy milk. It can be condensed milk, powder milk, whatever. Doesn't matter if it's pasteurized or anything like that? Uh, doesn't matter because it's still going to have lactic acid in it, and that's gotcha. ultimately what we're after. Okay. Um, or lactose, sorry, in it, which is ultimately what we're after. Um, and so, whenever we inoculate the milk, one to ten, one rice wash water to ten parts milk, um, we're starving everything but the lactic acid bacteria. Gotcha. Um, all the other bacteria has no food source and just dies. Right, because they feed off more sucrose, fructose, sure, different yep. carbohydrates like that yep. versus the lactose. Yep, that makes sense. Yep, perfect. And so that's going to separate. You're going to have a cheese curd at the top. You're going to have the whey in the middle, which is our lab. And then some trash at the bottom, which is probably all the dead bacteria. I don't know, what, I don't know what's down there. So cheese makes a great cheese, like a farmer cheese. You know, it's, yeah, it's really good. Is it more yeah. like a mozzarella type? You, there, you could do anything. I uh, guess they just add more whatever culture you want to put in there. Yeah. To it. Well, so you have the the curd, and so then it's just going to be kind of flavoring it. 
And so you could, you I could. I know they're doing some stuff to make it mozzarella like. Um, Kobe Guy is a really big one that, that's big on the cheese stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I have not made cheese with any of my curds yet. Animals love it. Like absolutely, will go crazy over it. Um, so you drain your lab. It's a it's a really good decomposer. Um, it's great to add to your compost pile, to your makashi bin. Um, it's great to add to your soil. Um, it's the police. Is is kind of the way I look at that. If if I have anything going on, uh, pest wise, disease wise, pathogen wise, root rot wise. Anything out of balance like that, I'm going to hit it with lab, and it's just going to strip the life out of it. So you add that to, like, the IMO water that you're making, or do you add it on, like, that medicine day that you were talking about? So so, so liquid IMO is, is kind of an independent thing um, that you can add those other supplements to, and, and I believe you could put lab in that. I don't think that would hurt anything, but you already have some lab in there as well. Okay. Um, and so lab is something that I typically will use just independently. Um, I'll typically make a, a uh, like a maintenance solution okay. and then just add it to that. Gotcha. Um, uh, I will spray lab, just lab. Um, most stuff in natural farming you would not use solo, but lab is one that you can. Okay. Um, and I would I would soil drench with lab solo as well. And is this more of a preventative or are you attacking something that's there? <laughs> there, there, there it, there's a lot of good uses for lab. Um, so in my beds where I have a lot of root balls, Lab's going to do a really good job of helping break that okay. organic material down. Um, in my coots mix that I didn't let cook long enough, and so coots mix is a super soil. It's aeration, compost, um, uh, amendments, you know, to balance out the soil. Um, so it's a super soil, and so that stuff slowly is breaking down in that soil, and I'm supposed to cook it for, say, a month. Sure. Well, if I only cook it for two weeks and I put my plants in it, everything's going to be great. They're just going to have some throw some lab in there that's going to help decompose, de uh, it's going to help help break that stuff that's down. That's a good idea. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, because I mean your amendments, they all of them take their amount of time for them to break down. Exactly. Some are faster than others. Exactly. So that's going to yep. kick start those breaking down in your soil. Yeah. yeah. It, it just makes okay. it, makes it, it, it speeds up that cooking process. I got you. Um, if I have a, a pile of, of wood chips outside that I want to turn into soil, go throw lab on it, come out a year later, You've basically got soil particle size material out there, okay. um, and, and, and year you know these are relative terms that are that are for what happens on our farm, um, and so lab is really good for. Um, uh, we haven't gotten into the human side of this, and so I guess maybe we'll jump into the, kind of the plant human comparison here. Lab's really good for for gut health. Um, most of us don't realize that our digestive system is directly related to every single part of our body and how we feel and whether we're tired. Uh, whether we're groggy, are we thinking clearly? Every bit of that is directly in response to our gut. Okay. Um, and and our gut is supposed to be 60% um, lactose bacillus, really? um, which is like the most powerful bacteria known to man. Well, that's the common one you see in all yogurts and everything. Mm -hmm. It's always yep. lactose bacillus. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so, but most of the foods that we eat strip all of that life out of our gut. Um, most of the processed stuff we eat. And so, um, the easiest way to look at a plant is that it is just like a human. And so if you're sick, you don't want a steak and potato, so you don't need to hit me with a lot of nitrogen, a lot of stuff to make me grow. Just just give me a little, a little, you know, homeopathic, you know, a little signaling in which direction to go in. Um, and, and so we kind of look at plants as, um, you know, as, as kind of infants and then going through puberty and then kind of that crossover teenage years and then adult life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and everything is very relatable to, to the human aspect of that as well. Um, in, in what inputs we give, uh, what solutions we make at those different times. Um, and, and ultimately, everything we're putting on our plants, you can drink and do regularly. Sure. I mean, labs, if it's made correctly, is, is pretty good. If it's not made correctly, it's, it's not bad. It's a little funky, a little, well, little cheesy, you know, a little cheesy taste. Well, and, and all of the uh, bases, too, are either an alcohol base or vinegar base, too. So yeah. nothing in there is going to hurt yeah. you that either, you know? Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's a really neat system, but again, it's, it's just a tool. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know, not to, not to bash can there's no solid pesticide uh, response. Yeah. Um, you're going to have, I don't, you know, we, we, we can argue over healthy plant bricks lemon. There's bugs. There's bugs. At some point, stuff gets out yeah, of balance, it always and there's happens, bugs. Man, it's just—it's it's so hard. You're always yeah, battling that yeah. stuff. Well, it's—it's it's, you know, you're—we're not always growing in the in the ideal environment. Right. Um, sometimes we're in the bottom of a gully where it stays kind of damp. Well, then you're overwatered pretty much all the time, so mm -hmm. then you have pest problems. Yep. 
You know, it doesn't matter how healthy you try to make the soil. So, especially uh, those little fungus gnats, man. Oh, they love man. wet soil. Man, they love that stuff. It is nuts. So Jadam is a good one, which is which is Master Cho's son started um, Jadam, and and, and um, its best tool, I think, is the pesticide version. Okay. And so there's a there's a Jadam wetting agent, which is like a Dr. Bronner soap that you can make at home. Um, it's a great uh, wetting agent. It works as a great pesticide. Um, there's a JHS Jerusalem Artichoke Solution. Uh, uh, good gosh, Jadam Herbal Solution. Okay. It's a Jerusalem artichoke that you make it out of. That did not come out. Of <laughs> um, and so anyway, it's uh, it it basically takes care of any hemp cannabis pest there is. Really? Um, yeah. It's, it's something you just spray foil your arm. Yep. Can you yep. water it in too? Uh, or is it more of a spray? You, you can water it in, but it's going to be effective as a spray. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, the the Jadam wetting agent is going to take care of almost anything. And if you have a mass uh, massive infestation or something. Um, that that uh, Jadam herbal solution, even though it's it's a, uh, and I guess technically it's an herbal solution, um, it's just a great pesticide. Those I would not suggest ingesting. Um, okay. Jadam is not. It's it's a it's a scientific base natural farming. It's extremely low income. Um, it's more putrefaction, water based stuff, permits okay. and stuff. Um, we probably won't go into all of that, but no, that sounds um, like a whole it's a, it's, another yep. little talking. About. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah. So one cool thing that I did just think about that uh, that uh, that's starting to be worked on is um, is for pest management in our IMO process um, is IPMO Indigenous Pest Microorganisms. Interesting. And so Chris has a very unique story that he tells that he was trying to make an IMO three or four and had a bag of grain that was full of weevils and had no time to do anything, couldn't, couldn't, you know, couldn't go source another bag. And so he just made it. Okay. You know? And uh, what he found um, was that the, uh, the uh, chitin um, was eating the bugs. Really? And so you were actually harvesting the fungus that was attracted to that beetle type bug. Oh. And so stink bugs for, for them, they have a, a bug. It's, it's called something different in Hawaii, but it's, it's very similar to a stink bug. That's a real pest for their, for their uh, macadamia nut farm. And, um, and so this is a, it's a, another development from Chris Trump that's going to improve kind of pre natural farming. That's awesome. um, one thing that I would say at this point is learn to make the stuff correctly as taught, and then feel free to run side by sides on how to improve anything, how to change anything. Uh, Master Cho said this is not finished. This needs to continue to grow and be developed. Um, if you make some random ferment and you follow no directions, no one's going to be able to tell you what it is. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Make the right one. Make your your invention. Run side, side by, by sides, sides, and then give us info, and like everyone will applaud you if you come up with something worthy. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. Um, us Americans like to change everything and make it better. And <laughs> yeah, always, man. <laughs> don't waste your time doing that. The, the, there's so much time and so much intention put into these very specific recipes and very, um, you know, very laid out directions on how to do it. Um, change it for your environment. But don't try to make it better. It, it doesn't. It doesn't need it to, doesn't be, need to be made better. Yeah, I got it. Doesn't need better. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that's it for today. It was good having you out here, David. Man. Awesome, man. Hopefully, everybody got to learn a little bit about KNF. Like we said, it's like I know this much. This man knows this much. And there's people that know that much. Yes. Uh, but all you can do, get in there, get your hands dirty, uh, have some fun with it, and um, go from there, man. Well, don't forget, like and subscribe. I'll see you guys next time. Awesome, man. Be good.